6. All that is solid melts into PR. Market Stalinism and Bureaucratic Anti-Production. Mike Judge's unjustly under-celebrated film Office Space, 1999, is as acute an account of the 90s noughties workplace as Schrader's Blue Collar, 1978, was of 70s labor relations. Instead of the confrontation between trade union officials and management in a factory, Judge's film shows a corporation sclerotized by administrative anti-production. Workers receive multiple memos from different managers saying the exact same thing. Naturally, the memo concerns a bureaucratic practice. It aims to induce compliance with a new procedure of putting cover sheets on reports. In keeping with the being smart ethos, the management style in office space is a mixture of shirt sleeves informality and quiet authoritarianism. Judge shows this same managerialism presides in the corporate coffee chains where the office workers go to relax. Here, staff are required to decorate their uniforms with seven pieces of flair, i.e. badges or other personal tokens, to express their individuality and creativity. A handy illustration of the way in which creativity and self-expression have become intrinsic to labour in control societies, which, as Paolo Virno, Jan Moulet Boutang and others have pointed out, now makes effective as well as productive demands on workers. Furthermore, the attempt to crudely quantify these effective contributions also tells us a great deal about the new arrangements. The flair example also points to another phenomenon, hidden expectations behind official standards. Joanna, a waitress at the coffee chain, wears exactly seven pieces of flair, but it is made clear to her that even though seven is officially enough, it is actually inadequate. The manager asks if she wants to look the sort of person who only does the bare minimum. You know what, Stan? If you want me to wear 37 pieces of flair, Joanna complains, why don't you just make the minimum 37 pieces of flair? Well, the manager replies, I thought I remembered you saying that you wanted to express yourself. Enough is no longer enough. This syndrome will be familiar to many workers who find that a satisfactory grading in a performance evaluation is no longer satisfactory. In many educational institutions, for instance, if after a classroom observation a teacher is graded as satisfactory, they will be required to undertake training prior to a reassessment. Initially, it might appear to be a mystery that bureaucratic measures should have intensified under neoliberal governments that have presented themselves as anti-bureaucratic and anti-Stalinist. Yet new kinds of bureaucracy, aims and objectives, outcomes, mission statements, have proliferated, even as neoliberal rhetoric about the end of top-down centralized control has gained preeminence. It might seem that bureaucracy is a kind of return of the repressed, ironically re-emerging at the heart of a system which has professed to destroy it. But the resurgence of bureaucracy in neoliberalism is more than an atavism or an anomaly. As I've already indicated, there is no contradiction between being smart and the increase of administration and regulation. They are two sides of labor in control societies. Richard Sennett has argued that the flattening of pyramidal hierarchies has actually led to more surveillance of workers. One of the claims made for the new organization of work is that it decentralizes power, that is, gives people in the lower ranks of organization more control over their own activities, Senate writes. Certainly this claim is false in terms of the techniques employed for taking apart the old bureaucratic behemoths. The new information systems provide a comprehensive picture of the organization to top managers in ways which give individuals anywhere in the network little room to hide. But it isn't only that information technology has granted managers more access to data, it is that the data itself has proliferated. Much of this information is provided by workers themselves. Massimo De Angelis and David Harvey describe some of the bureaucratic measures with which a lecturer must comply when putting together a module for an undergraduate degree in British universities. For each module, De Angelis and Harvey write, the module leader, ML, i.e. lecturer, must complete various paperwork, in particular a module specification at the module start which lists the module's aims and objectives, ILOs, modes and methods of assessment, amongst other information. 
and a module review document at the end of the module, in which the ML reports their own assessment of the module's strengths and weaknesses and their suggested changes for the following year, a summary of student feedback, and average marks and their dispersion. This is only the beginning, however. For the degree program as a whole, academics must prepare a program specification, as well as producing annual program reports, which record student performance according to progression rates, withdrawal rates, location, and spread of marks. All students' marks have to be graded against a matrix. This auto-surveillance is complemented by assessments carried out by external authorities. The marking of student assignments is monitored by external examiners, who are supposed to maintain consistency of standards across the university sector. Lecturers have to be observed by their peers, while departments are subject to periodic three- or four-day inspections by the Quality Assurance Agency for Higher Education, QAA. If they are research active, lecturers must submit their best four publications every four or five years to be graded by panel as part of the research assessment exercise, replaced in 2008 by the equally controversial Research Excellence Framework. De Angelis and Harvey are clear that these are only very sketchy accounts of only some of the bureaucratic tasks that academics have to perform, all of which have funding implications for institutions. This battery of bureaucratic procedures is by no means confined to universities, nor to education. Other public services, such as the National Health Service and the police force, find themselves enmeshed in similar bureaucratic metastases. This is in part a consequence of the inherent resistance of certain processes and services to marketization. The supposed marketization of education, for instance, rests on a confused and underdeveloped analogy. Are students the consumers of the service or its product? The idealized market was supposed to deliver friction-free exchanges in which the desires of consumers would be met directly without the need for intervention or mediation by regulatory agencies. Yet the drive to assess the performance of workers and to measure forms of labor, which, by their nature, are resistant to quantification, has inevitably required additional layers of management and bureaucracy. What we have is not a direct comparison of workers' performance or output, but a comparison between the audited representation of that performance and output. Inevitably, a short-circuiting occurs, and the work becomes geared towards the generation and massaging of representations rather than to the official goals of the work itself. Indeed, an anthropological study of local government in Britain argues that more effort goes into ensuring that the local authority services are represented correctly than goes into actually improving those services. This reversal of priorities is one of the hallmarks of a system which can be characterized without hyperbole as market Stalinism. What late capitalism repeats from Stalinism is just this valuing of symbols of achievement over actual achievement. As Marshall Berman explained, describing Stalin's White Seek in our project of 1931-3, Stalin seems to have been so intent on creating a highly visible symbol of development that he pushed and squeezed the project in ways that only retarded the development of the project. Thus the workers and the engineers were never allowed the time, money, or equipment necessary to build a canal that would be deep enough and safe enough to carry 20th century cargoes. Consequently, the canal has never played any significant role in Soviet commerce or industry. All the canal could support, apparently, were tourist steamers, which, in the 1930s, were abundantly stocked with Soviet and foreign writers who obligingly proclaimed the glories of the work. The canal was a triumph of publicity. But if half the care that went into the public relations campaign had been devoted to the work itself there would have been far fewer victims and far more real developments, and the project would have been a genuine tragedy rather than a brutal farce in which real people were killed by pseudo-events. In a strange compulsion to repeat, the ostensibly anti-Stalinist neoliberal New Labour government has shown the same tendency to implement initiatives in which real-world effects matter only insofar as they register at the level of PR, appearance. The notorious targets which the new Labour government was so enthusiastic in imposing are a case in point. In a process that repeats itself with iron predictability everywhere that they are installed, targets quickly cease to be a way of measuring performance and become ends in themselves. Anxiety about falling standards in school examinations is now a regular feature of the summertime in Britain. 
Yet if students are less skilled and knowledgeable than their predecessors, this is due not to a decline in the quality of examinations per se, but to the fact that all of the teaching is geared towards passing the exams. Narrowly focused exam drill replaces a wider engagement with subjects. Similarly, hospitals perform many routine procedures instead of a few serious urgent operations because this allows them to hit the targets they are assessed on, operating rates, success rates, and reduction in waiting time, more effectively. It would be a mistake to regard this market Stalinism as some deviation from the true spirit of capitalism. On the contrary, it would be better to say that an essential dimension of Stalinism was inhibited by its association with a social project like socialism, and can only emerge in a late capitalist culture in which images acquire an autonomous force. The way value is generated on the stock exchange depends, of course, less on what a company really does, and more on perceptions of and beliefs about its future performance. In capitalism, that is to say, all that is solid melts into PR, and late capitalism is defined at least as much by this ubiquitous tendency towards PR production as it is by the imposition of market mechanisms. Here, Zizek's elaboration of Lacan's concept of the big other is crucial. The big other is the collective fiction, the symbolic structure, presupposed by any social field. The big other can never be encountered in itself. Instead, we only ever confront its stand-ins. These representatives are by no means always leaders. In the example of the White Sea Canal above, for instance, it wasn't Stalin himself who was the representative of the big other, so much as the Soviet and foreign writers who had to be persuaded of the glories of the project. One important dimension of the big other is that it does not know anything. It is this constitutive ignorance of the big other that allows public relations to function. Indeed, the big other could be defined as the consumer of PR and propaganda, the virtual figure which is required to believe even when no individual can. To use one of Zizek's examples, who was it, for instance, who didn't know that really existing socialism, RAS, was shabby and corrupt? Not any of the people who were all too aware of its shortcomings, nor any of the government administrators who couldn't but know. No, it was the big other who was the one who deemed not to know, who wasn't allowed to know, the quotidian reality of RES. Yet the distinction between what the big other knows, i.e. what is officially accepted, and what is widely known and experienced by actual individuals, is very far from being merely emptily formal. It is the discrepancy between the two that allows ordinary social reality to function. When the illusion that the big other did not know can no longer be maintained, the incorporeal fabric holding the social system together disintegrates. This is why Khrushchev's speech in 1965, in which he admitted the failings of the Soviet state, was so momentous. It is not as if anyone in the party was unaware of the atrocities and corruption carried out in its name, but Khrushchev's announcement made it impossible to believe any more that the big other was ignorant of them. So much for really existing socialism, but what of really existing capitalism? One way to understand the realism of capitalist realism is in terms of the claim to have given up belief in the big other. Postmodernism can be construed as the name for the complex of crises that the decline in the belief in the big other has triggered, as Lyotard's famous formulation of the postmodern condition, incredulity towards meta-narratives, suggests. Jameson, of course, would argue that the incredulity towards metanarratives is one expression of the cultural logic of late capitalism, a consequence of the switch into the post-Fordist mode of capital accumulation. Nick Land gives one of the most euphoric accounts of the postmodern meltdown of culture into the economy. In Land's work, a cybernetically upgraded invisible hand is progressively eliminating centralized state power. Land's 90s texts synthesize cybernetics, complexity theory, cyberpunk fiction, and neoliberalism to construct a vision of capital planetary artificial intelligence, a vast, supple, endlessly fissile system which renders human will obsolete. In his manifesto for non-linear, decentered capital, Meltdown, 
land invokes a massively distributed matrix networked tendency oriented to disabling ROM command control programs sustaining all macro and micro governmental entities, globally concentrating themselves as the human security system. This is capitalism as a shattering reel, in which viral, digital signals circulate on self-sustaining networks which bypass the symbolic and therefore do not require the big other as guarantor. It is Deleuze and Guattari's capital as unnameable thing, but without the forces of re-territorialization and anti-production which they argued were constitutive of capitalism. One of the problems of Land's position is also what is most interesting about it, precisely that it posits a pure capitalism, a capitalism which is only inhibited and blocked by extrinsic rather than internal elements. According to Land's logic, these elements are atavisms that will eventually be consumed and metabolized by capital. Yet capitalism cannot be purified in this way. Strip away the forces of anti-production, and capitalism disappears with them. Similarly, there is no progressive tendency towards an unsheathing of capitalism, no gradual unmasking of capital as it really is. Rapacious, indifferent, inhuman. On the contrary, the essential role of the incorporeal transformations effectuated by PR, branding and advertising in capitalism, suggests that in order to operate effectively, capitalism's rapacity depends upon various forms of sheathing. Really existing capitalism is marked by the same division which characterized really existing socialism between, on the one hand, an official culture in which capitalist enterprises are presented as socially responsible and caring, and, on the other, a widespread awareness that companies are actually corrupt, ruthless, etc. In other words, capitalist postmodernity is not quite as incredulous as it would appear to be, as the jeweler Gerald Ratner famously found to his cost. Ratner precisely tried to circumvent the symbolic and tell it how it is, describing the inexpensive jewellery his shop sold as crap in an after-dinner speech. But the consequence of Ratner making this judgment official were immediate and serious. Five hundred million pounds was wiped off the value of the company, and he lost his job. Customers might previously have known that the jewellery Ratner sold was poor quality, but the big other didn't know. As soon as it did, Ratner's collapsed. Vernacular postmodernism has dealt with the crisis of symbolic efficiency in a far less intense way than Nick Land through metafictional anxieties about the function of the author, and in television programs or films which expose the mechanisms of their own productions and reflexively incorporate discussions of their own status as commodities. But postmodernism's supposed gestures of demystification do not evince sophistication so much as a certain naivety, a conviction that there were others in the past who really believed in the symbolic. In fact, of course, Symbolic efficiency was achieved precisely by maintaining a clear distinction between a material empirical causality and another incorporeal causality proper to the symbolic. Zizek gives the example of a judge. I know very well that things are the way I see them, that this person is a corrupted weakling, but I nonetheless treat him respectfully since he wears the insignia of a judge so that when he speaks, it is the law itself which speaks through him. However, postmodernism's cynical reduction to reality falls short. When a judge speaks, there is in a way more truth in his words, the words of the institution of law, than in the direct reality of the person of judge. If one limits oneself to what one sees, one simply misses the point. Lacan aims at this paradox with his les non dupes errants, those who do not allow themselves to be caught in the symbolic deception fiction, who continue to believe their eyes, are the ones who err most. A cynic who believes only his eyes misses the efficiency of the symbolic fiction and how it structures our experience of reality. Much of Baudrillard's work was a commentary on this same effect, the way in which the abolition of the symbolic led not to a direct encounter with the real, but to a kind of hemorrhaging of the real. For Baudrillard, phenomena such as fly-on-the-wall documentaries and political opinion polls, both of which claim to present reality in an unmediated way, would always pose an insoluble dilemma. Did the presence of the cameras affect the behavior of those being filmed? 
Would the publication of poll results affect the future behaviour of voters? Such questions were undecidable, and therefore reality would always be elusive. At the very moment when it seemed that it was being grasped in the raw, reality transformed into what Baudrillard, in a much misunderstood neologism, called hyperreality. Uncannily echoing Baudrillard's fixations, the most successful reality television programmes ended up fusing fly-on-the-wall documentary elements with interactive polling. In effect, there are two levels of reality in these shows, the unscripted behaviour of the real-life participants on screen and the unpredictable responses of the audience at home, which in turn affect the behaviour of the on-screen participants. Yet reality TV is continually haunted by questions about fiction and illusion. Are the participants acting, suppressing certain aspects of their personality in order to appear more appealing to us, the audience? And have the audience's votes been accurately registered, or is there some kind of a fix? The slogan that the Big Brother TV show uses, You Decide, captures perfectly the mode of control by feedback that, according to Baudrillard, has replaced old centralized forms of power. We ourselves occupy the empty seat of power, phoning and clicking in our responses. TV's Big Brother has superseded Orwell's Big Brother. We, the audience, are not subjected to a power that comes from outside. Rather, we are integrated into a control circuit that has our desires and preferences as its only mandate. But those desires and preferences are returned to us, no longer as ours, but as the desires of the Big Other. Clearly, these circuits are not confined to television. Cybernetic feedback systems, focus groups, demographic surveys, are now integral to the delivery of all services, including education and government. This returns us to the issue of post-Fordist bureaucracy. There is, of course, a close relationship between bureaucracy, the discourse of officialdom, and the big other. Witness two of Zizek's own examples of the big other at work. A low-level official who, having not been informed of a promotion, says, Sorry, I have not yet been properly informed about this new measure, so I can't help you. A woman who believed that she was suffering bad luck because of the number of her house, who could not be satisfied by simply repainting a different number herself because it had to be done properly by the responsible state institution. We are all familiar with bureaucratic libido, with the enjoyment that certain officials derive from this position of disavowed responsibility. It's not me, I'm afraid. It's the regulations. The frustration of dealing with bureaucrats often arises because they themselves can make no decisions, Rather, they are permitted only to refer to decisions that have always already been made by the big other. Kafka was the greatest writer on bureaucracy because he saw that this structure of disavowal was inherent to bureaucracy. The quest to reach the ultimate authority who will finally resolve Kay's official status can never end because the big other cannot be encountered in itself. There are only officials, more or less hostile, engaged in acts of interpretation about the big other's intentions. And these acts of interpretation, these deferrals of responsibility, are all that the big other is. If Kafka is valuable as a commentator on totalitarianism, it is by revealing that there was a dimension of totalitarianism which cannot be understood on the model of despotic command. Kafka's purgatorial vision of a bureaucratic labyrinth without end chimes with Zizek's claim that the Soviet system was an empire of signs in which even the nomenclatura themselves, including Stalin and Molotov, were engaged in interpreting a complex series of social semiotic signals. No one knew what was required. Instead, individuals could only guess what particular gestures or directives meant. What happens in late capitalism, when there is no possibility of appealing, even in principle, to a final authority which can offer the definitive official version, is a massive intensification of that ambiguity. As an example of this syndrome, let us turn once more to further education. At a meeting between trade union officials, college principals and members of parliament, the Learning and Skills Council, LSC, the quango at the heart of the FE funding labyrinth, came in for particular attack. Neither the teachers, nor the principals, nor the MPs could determine how particular directives had generated themselves, since they are not there in government policy itself. The answer was that the LSC interpreted the instructions issued by the Department for Education and Skills. These interpretations then achieve the strange autonomy peculiar to bureaucracy. On the one hand, bureaucratic procedures float freely, 
independent of any external authority. But that very autonomy means that they assume a heavy implacability, a resistance to any amendment or questioning. The proliferation of auditing culture in post-Fordism indicates that the demise of the big other has been exaggerated. Auditing can perhaps best be conceived of as fusion of PR and bureaucracy, because the bureaucratic data is usually intended to fulfill a promotional role. In the case of education, for example, exam results or research ratings augment, or diminish, the prestige of particular institutions. The frustration for the teacher is that it seems as if their work is increasingly aimed at impressing the big other, which is collating and consuming this data. Data has been put in inverted commas here because much of the so-called information has little meaning or application outside the parameters of the audit. As Eva Berglund puts it, the information that audit creates does have consequences, even though it is so shorn of local detail, so abstract as to be misleading or meaningless, except, that is, by the aesthetic criteria of audit itself. New bureaucracy takes the form not of a specific delimited function performed by particular workers, but invades all areas of work, with the result that, as Kafka prophesied, workers become their own auditors, forced to assess their own performance. Take, for example, the new system that Ofsted, Office for Standards in Education, uses to inspect further education colleges. Under the old system, a college would have a heavy inspection once every four years or so, i.e. one involving many lesson observations and a large number of inspectors present in the college. Under the new improved system, if a college can demonstrate that its internal assessment systems are effective, it will only have to undergo a light inspection. But the downside of this light inspection is obvious. Surveillance and monitoring are outsourced from Ofsted to the college, and ultimately to lecturers themselves, and become a permanent feature of the college structure and of the psychology of individual lecturers. The difference between the old, heavy, and new light inspection system corresponds precisely to Kafka's distinction between ostensible acquittal and indefinite postponement, outlined above. With ostensible acquittal, you petition the lower court judges until they grant you a non-binding reprieve, you are then free from the court until the time when your case is reopened. Indefinite postponement, meanwhile, keeps your case at the lowest level of the court, but at the cost of an anxiety that never ends. The changes in Ofsted inspections are mirrored in the change from the research assessment exercise to the research excellence framework in higher education. Periodic assessment will be superseded by a permanent and ubiquitous measurement which cannot help but generate the same perpetual anxiety. In any case, it is not as if the light inspection is in any sense preferable for staff than the heavy one. The inspectors are in the college for the same amount of time as they were under the old system. The fact that there are fewer of them does nothing to alleviate the stress of the inspection, which has far more to do with the extra bureaucratic window dressing one has to do in anticipation of a possible observation, than it has to do with any actual observation itself. The inspection, that is to say, corresponds precisely to Foucault's account of the virtual nature of surveillance in Discipline and Punish. Foucault famously observes that there is no need for the place of surveillance to actually be occupied. The effect of not knowing whether you will be observed or not produces an interjection of the surveillance apparatus. You constantly act as if you are always about to be observed, Yet in the case of school and university inspections, what you will be graded on is not primarily your abilities as a teacher so much as your diligence as a bureaucrat. There are other bizarre effects. Since Ofsted is now observing the college's self-assessment systems, there is an implicit incentive for the college to grade itself and its teaching lower than it actually deserves. The result is a kind of postmodern capitalist version of Maoist confessionalism, in which workers are required to engage in constant symbolic self-denigration. At one point, when our line manager was extolling the virtues of the new light inspection system, he told us that the problem with our departmental logbooks was that they were not sufficiently self-critical. But don't worry, he urged, any self-criticisms we make are purely symbolic and will never be acted upon, as if performing self-adulation as part of a purely formal exercise in cynical bureaucratic compliance were any less demoralizing.
In the post Fordis classroom, the reflexive impotence of the students is mirrored by reflexive impotence of the teachers. De Angelis and Harvey report that practices and requirements of standardization and surveillance obviously impose a huge burden of work on academics and few are happy about it. There have been a number of responses. Managers have frequently suggested there is no alternative. Tina. And have perhaps suggested that what we need to do is work smarter and not harder. This seductive slogan introduced to dampen staff resistance to further change, which in their, our, experience, has a devastating effect on working conditions, attempts to couple the need for change, restructuring and innovation, in order to meet the budget pressure and increase competitiveness, with staff's resistance not only to worsening of their condition of work, but also to the educational and academic meaninglessness of the changes. The invocation of the idea that there is no alternative, and the recommendation to work smarter, not harder, shows how capitalist realism sets the tone for labor disputes in post-Fordism. Ending the inspection regime, one lecturer sardonically remarked, seems more impossible than ending slavery was. Such fatalism can only be challenged if a new, collective, political subject emerges.